When it comes to understanding the dynamics of fabrics, the most important aspects are the points of tension and the direction of forces against them. The simplest type of fold is the pipe fold, which has the force of gravity pulling down on it and one point of tension holding it up with a force in the opposite direction. The once square and flat fabric will concede to the downward force of gravity and arrange itself in a descending S-curve. This S-curve creates a series of alternating half-cylinders whose folds all direct back to the one single point of tension. Repeating this fold in a more dynamic angle will reveal its semi-cylindrical nature. Notice that those semi-cylinders curving away from us will be obscured by those overlapping in front. Adding a second point of tension creates what is referred to as a diaper fold. Rather than a series of half cylinders, this situation creates a series of U-shaped curves that become steeper in slope as they descend. Also notice that the diaper fold is bounded by two pipe folds on either side. Again we can repeat the fold in a more dynamic angle to reveal more about the forms. Each of those U-shapes has volume to it, which I'm indicating here with hatching. One of the more confusing folds is the half-lock. This fold occurs anytime one side of the piece of fabric is compressed and the opposite is stretched, as is typical in the bending of the elbow and the knee. If we look at this fold in perspective, we see that the compressed side has a U-shaped depression, and often the top part of the fabric will fold over onto the bottom half. A somewhat more intuitive fold is the spiral fold, which occurs from a twisting force that is applied to a fabric. The most pronounced example of this is when someone rotates their arm and the fabric rotates along with it. So long as you understand the three-dimensional form that the fabric is rotating around, creating a spiral fold should be relatively intuitive. Now let's see some examples of these folds in a few real-life images. Here on this woman's dress, we again see the familiar pipe fold. Take note of that alternating half-cylinder motif that we see in the pipe fold. Here on this shoulder wrap, we see the diaper fold indicative of two points of tension. Here you can clearly see that the slope of each of these U-shaped motifs increases as we descend further from the points of tension. A good shorthand to think about is that most folds will lead back to the tension point. The buckle on this man's bag provides an upward force to the left side of the fabric. Tension lines radiate outwards from it. The fabric on this man's outstretched arm is twisted as a result of the rotation in his lower arm. These spiral folds wrap around the cylindrical form of his arm. In this next picture we see a good example of a half-lock fold, which is caused by the bunching of fabric on the inner elbow as the arm contracts. The fabric on the opposite side exhibits less folding because it is stretched rather than compressed. A fold that I haven't mentioned yet is the zigzag fold, which results as a bending of a pipe fold. It creates this interlocking zigzag pattern that you can see here on this man's lower arm. Sometimes these folds occur in areas that you wouldn't necessarily expect, and oftentimes they combine with one another. In this top left image, you can see that there's a double half lock fold occurring at each armpit. Because the material is much looser, it creates larger and more plentiful folds. The half-lock folds that are occurring in the second photo on the right are much smaller due to less abundant material. In the bottom left photo, we see that the pant legs of both men are tucked into their boots. We can also see two folds occurring as a result. The first we see is a descending spiral fold, as the pant leg will inevitably be twisted. Then at the junction between the pant leg and the boot, we see a series of half-lock folds as the material is compressed. 
The same thing is occurring here on this image at the bottom right. The material at the armpit is being tucked into the armor, creating spiral and half-lock folds. Something that students generally overlook are points of connection. What I mean by this are the buckles and facets that connect articles of clothing together. There's a lot of intricacies to these points of connection, but our main goal should be to make them appear functional. A belt doesn't simply rest on the body. It has a buckle with which the belt is looped through to create more tension. And that tension exerts a force on the underlying fabric. What about bags and satchels that are so often placed on video game characters? I usually see students depict them as flat and lacking in detail. But there's much more to them than one would expect. For example, each edge has a seam as multiple pieces of fabric are stitched together. The overlying flap has volume, so I add a heavy line weight to indicate that cast shadow. And then a buckle will be stitched to this flap to fasten it shut. Try to think about the logic with which everything is put together. And take a look at items from everyday life to study how they work. While it might seem like it's a lot to think about for small details, it's really only a few extra lines. But they demonstrate that you've thought about the subject and that you understand it. Another element to think about is how these elements are connected back to the person who's carrying them. They could be connected to the belt, as in this top right example, or slung over the shoulder in the bottom left example. But asking these types of questions leads to more believability in your final images. The seam on the back of this bottom right garb is fastened together with tiny belts and buckles. This allows the wearer to put on the garb easily over their chainmail and then have someone else fasten it in the back. The same goes for the armor on the legs. There are two pieces of metal that are held together by buckles, which are held onto the metal by bolts. The fabric that's tucked into this leg armor will be exhibiting those spiral and half-lock folds that we demonstrated earlier. Since we already started talking a little bit about armor, let's go a bit further. I'm not going to go completely into detail about each component because a quick Google search will tell you this, but I want to establish how we should think about armor. Keep in mind what it's designed for, protection and mobility. In order to obtain that mobility, it's designed so that it wraps around the forms of the body so that the adorner can wear it comfortably and articulate his joints. What this means is that if we understand the underlying three-dimensional forms, we can easily draw in our armor. These shoulder plates follow an elliptical path around the cylindrical form of the arm, and are segmented so that the arm can move easily. When drawing, it can be helpful to use a heavier line weight to indicate the cast shadow of one plate over the other, and remember that they're fastened together with bolts. You can see here on the armor covering the pelvis that some of these seams are held together with belts and buckles. Keep in mind that this armor doesn't just float on the surface of the skin. It's placed above cloth and then held to the body via gravity, buckles, and belts.
Have a look at the counter and vambrans, which are the elbow and forearm coverings, and I'm probably pronouncing them incorrectly. Notice how the counter finds a strong balance between protecting the elbow joint while allowing it to bend. The same is true of the leg armor, or in fancy terms, the cuisse, paline, and grave. In this bottom right image, you can see that the back of the knee is left completely unprotected, which allows for full mobility of the leg. Each piece of armor protecting the upper leg, knee, and lower leg are separate so that the leg can articulate. Now I'm just going to do a few sketches combining all of these elements together. I'm starting out with a looser gesture drawing to get some of the movement before fleshing out my final details. This is very similar to how I'd work if I was drawing traditionally in pencil. Alright guys, and that's it for me this week. If you liked the video, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We'll be putting out new videos every week, and I'll be live streaming every Saturday and Sunday at 1pm Eastern Standard Time. If you'd like to support the channel, consider signing up on Patreon. We have a lot of cool perks, like access to the archive of full-length live streams, as well as group lessons. And if you'd like to learn from me in person, consider signing up for one of my courses at the Brainstorm School in Burbank, California. Thanks for watching guys, see you next time.